speaker tonight, uh, Joseph Wolyniak, and uh, let him introduce himself. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, thank you all for being on the call. Uh, special thanks again to, to Miguel and Brendan and everyone at the Episcopal Church Foundation. I can't tell you enough uh, what their support means uh, to those of us who are our fellows. They really do amazing work. I don't know when they sleep, um, but they are incredibly dedicated uh, to, to the Episcopal Church, and I'm, I'm really deeply appreciative of everything they do. Um, and thanks to, to the uh, Church of the Ascension uh, here in Denver, uh, and to Father Lucas Scrubs, the director there, uh, for, for hosting me to do this. Um, I don't have as reliable of internet connection at home, so they've been kind enough to uh, let me hang out here in their parish offices. So if you hear kids in the background, um, they're either just clamoring to get in on this presentation, or they've just been let out of the after school program. Um, but uh, I'm a PhD student at the uh, University of Oxford, finishing up a dissertation right now um, as a visiting scholar at the University of Denver in the Department of Religious Studies. Um, and I'm a lay member of St. John's Cathedral here in Denver, where uh, my partner, Liz Costello, is a curate, um, soon to be ordained here to the priesthood in uh, a week, just over a week. Um, but thank you again for everyone, um, and very much look, looking forward to our conversation and our time together. Let me give you just a brief overview of what I hope to accomplish uh, in this talk. Um, first of all, I want to talk about some of the prevailing um, common opinions and assumptions about the relationship of uh, science, technology, medicine, and faith. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about science and religion, um, but, but things that I say uh, are relevant to uh, medicine, technology, and so on. Um, I want to talk about what some of our common assumptions are, uh, particularly in popular culture, uh, and also what the academic, the current academic consensus about science and religion is. Um, secondly, I want to talk about the Episcopal Church in particular, how the Episcopal Church approaches the relationship of science, technology, and faith, both in terms of its orientation, its assumptions about the relationship, how the Episcopal Church is organized, and what mechanisms there are within the Episcopal Church structures for engaging a whole range of issues um, at the uh, nexus of science and religion. We'll have a, a brief uh, time for, for Q&A and discussion after the end of the second part of this presentation um, for you to share your thoughts, opinions, uh, objections, uh, questions uh, on, on that material. And then I want to go into a much more nuts and bolts uh, piece of the pre presentation and some practical pointers uh, for dialogue, um, some ideas and resources for parish and diocesan uh, engagement at the grassroots. And finally, I want to make sure that we have time at the end for some group discussion and sharing your questions, ideas, and especially your best practices. I've already seen this can be um, rather distracting to see how many fascinating people are on this call here um, to, to the left of my screen. Um, and I know that there are a couple of folks on this call that um, I've tapped and asked if they would uh, make it a point to be on this, to share from, from their perspective and experience on engaging this, uh, these issues. So I want to make sure that we have some time um, for that conversation at the end. So I, I think I, I hardly need to suggest to you that uh, the common assumption about science and, and religion uh, that pervades a contemporary culture uh, is that these two entities um, are locked in inevitable uh, conflict, um, an inexorable conflict. Um, science and religion are, uh, are often pitted against one another in some sort of cosmic stru struggle, uh, reason versus faith, progress versus tradition, verifiable hypothesis versus unquestionable revelation, demonstrated truths versus unchanging dogma, the human mind versus the word of God, so on and so on and so on. Um, just within the past few months, we said, had some really interesting examples of this supposed conflict between science and religion. Um, perhaps you watched the recent debate between Ken Ham the founder of the Creation Museum in Kentucky, I believe, uh, and Bill Nye, the science guy, um, who I was a huge fan of when I was a kid, um, who debated uh, about evolution, intelligent design, the origin of the universe, 
uh, et cetera. The, the debate was massively uh, well attended. There were over 3 million viewers uh, that watched the debate in real time. And there have been uh, uh, an ever-increasing number of people who have watched the debate on YouTube afterwards. Um, it was a trending topic on Twitter, so on and so forth. Um, uh, so there's a, this fascinating debate. Uh, and also recently, Neil deGrasse Tyson has revamped the uh, Cosmos series that uh, was wildly popular in its early iteration uh, with Carl Sagan. And this uh, TV series has uh, whipped creationists into a frenzy. Um, uh, and it's also irked some historians and philosophers of science as well for some of the claims that it makes about uh, science. Um, I could go on and on and on and on and on, um, but you don't need my litany of examples. Uh, you undoubtedly have your own, and uh, I hope to hear from some of you some of the uh, assumptions that uh, you've encountered as, as you've talked about being a person of faith who um, tries to hold together a commitment to uh, scientific reason. Um, but I want to suggest that the, the, the question is not whether whether there is a perceived conflict uh, between science and religion uh, in contemporary culture. But where does that perception come from, um, and whether or not it's accurate? So the answer to that question is incredibly long um, and complex, uh, and is well beyond the purview of, of uh, the five-minute time frame I'm trying to um, condense this all into here. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to suggest any number of resources uh, that will fill your beach bags uh, for the summer, if you'd like. Um, but I want to focus on, on two books in particular uh, here um, that were incredibly influential uh, in our contemporary assumptions. about the relationship between uh, science and religion. Both of these books were written at the end of the 19th um, uh, century uh, and went into successive uh, editions throughout the early 20th um, century. Um, uh, the first is the uh, rather unambiguously titled History of Conflict Between Religion and Science, published in 18. 74 by John William Draper. Um, John William Draper was a, a physician, a chemist, historian, philosopher, and and a photographer. Um, he's made a number of contributions to uh, science. Uh, Uh, including um, to uh, photochemistry, uh, uh, early photochemistry, and was one of the first person to take a detailed photograph of the moon in 1840. Um, he, he was one of the founders of New York University's medical school and was a first president of the American Chemical Society, elected in 1876. Uh, NYU has a, an interdisciplinary master's program that's named after uh, John William Draper. Um, but his book, uh, uh, published alongside, um, or, or just before, uh, a book by Andrew Dickinson White, who was an Episcopalian, uh, my friend who was Charles, who's on his call, um, 
told me that. Uh, uh, he published an, a second um, book with an equally ambiguous title, The History of the Warfare Between Theology Uh, warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. That is a two-volume set published in 1896. Um, and uh, Andrew Dickinson White, among being a historian and a diplomat, was the uh, uh, first president and uh, co-founder of Cornell University. Um, and he had this to say at the foundation of the university, um, that he wished it would be an asylum to science where truth shall be sought for truth sake, not stretched or cut, to fit exactly revealed religion. Um, the titles of these two books give themselves away. They're available, uh, they're not under copyright anymore, and are readily available online uh, as downloadable PDFs, or you, know, you can read them on, on Google Books um, if, if you're interested. Um, but their titles really give them away. What they do is they look, take a broad view of history, um, and look at various episodes where science and religion have uh, interacted. Uh, and they surmise that uh, science and religion have been locked in inevitable and inexorable conflict um, uh, since at least science arrived on the scene. Um, the only problem with the thesis of these two books, um, hugely influential as they have been, is that they're wrong. Um, Starting with Thomas Kuhn's uh, hugely influential structures and scientific revolution, there's been something of a revolution in the history of, of science uh, here over the last few decades. Uh, and scientists have, have begun, historians have begun to take a much closer look at the relationship between science and religion in particular historical context. Um, and what they have found is that uh, the relationship is a lot more complicated uh, and also a lot more exciting than the conflict uh, thesis presumes. Uh, historians of science have gone so far uh, that these days, whenever you're beginning your orientation to the history of science, um, usually uh, historians will talk about this Draper White conflict myth um, as, uh, as an overarching um, yet wrong assumption about the relationship between science and faith. And his, the history of science tends to use this uh, assumption as a, a starting point that it then systematically debunks with episode after episode. So if the relationship is more complex and more exciting than the conflict myth presumes, um, what other options are on the table? Uh, well, this book here, written by a physicist and philosopher, the late uh, Ian G. Barber, a religion, science, historical, Contemporary Issues, um, which was originally given as his Gifford Lectures uh, in uh, 1989, I believe. Um, uh, this book has been hugely influential. One author said that it was single-handedly gave rise to the academic discipline of science and religion, one of the fastest growing academic disciplines in the academy today. Um, in Barber's book, he puts forth a fourfold typology. Um, he surveys uh, what uh, Theologians and philosophers have had to say about the relationship between science and religion for the last several centuries. Um, and he suggests that there are, are four main categories of, uh, of that engagement. One is the conflict myth. And you can put the, the likes of Richard Dawkins or indeed a, a Ken Ham in, in this camp. And the suggestion here is that science and religion are competing for the same ground in a zero-sum game. Um, there's going to be a winner, there's going to be a, a loser. 
Uh, and it's just a matter of, of them duking it out and one coming out victorious. Um, so that's a pretty well-known assumption we've heard, that we've uh, talked about here at the beginning. A second uh, way of conceptualizing the relationship between science and religion um, is that of independence. Um, perhaps uh, Stephen Jay Gould is the best exemplar of, of this view. Um, in his book, The Paleontologist from uh, Harvard, uh, in his book, The Rock of Ages, he talks about non-overlapping magisteria. Um, there's a great podcast I was just listening to yesterday, actually, where he, he talks about this and defends it, um, this idea of, of the complete independence, or this non-overlapping magisteria uh, against a couple of scholars. I can send you that link if you're interested. Um, but the idea here is that uh, science and religion are not competing um, for the same ground. They're asking very different kinds of questions, uh, and they have very different kinds of methods. Um, so there cannot be conflict, because um, never the twain shall meet. Um, uh, so uh, this has been a, a, a hugely influential uh, conception of the relationship as, as well. Um, then there are, are two more here, that um, if you don't buy conflict that they're competing for the exact same uh, ground or space, um, and you don't buy independence, um, uh, strict independence, that they have absolutely occupy completely different spheres and have absolutely nothing to say to one another, you may fall into one of these two camps of dialogue, um, where science and religion occupy primarily um, different uh, uh, grounds, um, have primarily different methods, but oftentimes they will come up against one another. Um, and uh, the conversation between the two of them um, can be fruitful. Uh, many scholars within science and religion today hold some version of a, of a dialogue view between the two, um, supporting um, primarily independence, um, but also uh, thinking that there might be something to learn from the dialogue between the two. And fourthly, finally, um, integration. The idea that, um, that the conceptual space shared by science and religion um, can be rather large, uh, and that it is possible to integrate uh, the knowledge gained from the sciences into uh, theological worldviews. Usually, people that hold an uh, integration view uh, see a, a one-way movement from science um, to religion. John Cobb and process theologians um, might fall into to this camp. Um, but trying to take some of the lessons learned from science and integrate it into um, a, a faith worldview. Um, one of the points to make about this, though, um, is, is this. Uh, one of the fundamental takeaways, I think, for us um, is that conflict is one of only four ways of conceptualizing this relationship. Um, whether you hold to an independence view, a dialogue view, or an integration view, um, all three of those views are, I, I would argue, some version of the compatibility of science and uh, religion, science and faith. Um, so, uh, and, and I would say that the, the majority of people who spend their days thinking about these things fall into one of those three latter camps. Um, so, don't have a tremendous amount of time to, to go into these in detail, but I would just mention that um, we talked about the history of science. Um, philosophers of science tend to talk about various isms within uh, the philosophy of science, uh, whether that's reductionism, materialism, naturalism, methodological or metaphysical naturalism, or indeed of late there's been a lot of talk about scientism. Um, and essentially what philosophers are trying to do is to think through um, the knowledge that is gained from empirical sciences uh, and to ask whether that gives a complete and sufficient view of the world, and if not, um, whether there might be a more nuanced uh, idea of how we ascertain knowledge. Um, and so there are a variety of positions on these various isms, uh, but, uh, but, but conflict does not necessarily hold sway within the philosophy of science. Likewise, theologians um, tend to, um, again, painting with broad brushstrokes here, but, but tend in general to talk about truth not contradicting truth, um, that faith and, and reason, scientific reason, philosophical reason, um, occupy legitimate spheres of, of inquiry. Um, and indeed, uh, reason can play particular help uh, in illuminating uh, uh, matters of, of faith. Um, 
within the Anglican tradition, um, perhaps the most famous person uh, in this regard is, is Richard Hooker, um, who talked about um, scripture, uh, tradition, and, and reason, and how tradition and reason um, aid in the interpretation of scripture to develop a holistic uh, worldview. Um, so I can say about, more about that in detail um, for those who are interested. But what, what about the Episcopal Church in particular? I assume all of us on this call are Episcopalians um, and uh, may be wondering whether or not uh, the Episcopal Church has taken a stance on the relationship between science and uh, faith. Uh, and indeed, uh, as of the 77th General Convention, uh, July 2012, uh, the Episcopal Church has. Um, a general convention, the House of Bishops and House of Deputies, passed this resolution, A136, which was pr proposed by um, the Executive Council Committee on Science, Technology, and Faith, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and uh, it, it passed with unanimous consent. Uh, I just want to look at a, a couple of the key provisions of this resolution uh, and think about them in light of our, our discussion this evening. Um, first, and perhaps foremost. Um, the resolution reads that the 77th General Convention affirms that there is no inherent contradiction between holding and practicing the Christian faith and practicing or utilizing the outcomes of science and medicine. No inherent co contradiction. Secondly, that the proper practice of science cannot and does not automatically lead its practitioners or others to lose faith in God or to be led into beliefs that contradict the existence of God. Fourth, the methods of science, when applied to the search for truth, contribute to our understanding of God's creation, such that we should use scientific information. After diligence as to its acceptance among scientific peers and relevant disciplines, to inform and augment our understanding of God's creation, and to aid the church in developing Christian programs and policies consistent with our faith and our understanding of God's creation and our stewardship of it. The methods of science contribute. Uh, fourth, the, this convention encourages dioceses and parishes of the Episcopal Church to establish Christian education programs pertinent to this complementary relationship between science and faith. So we've been encouraged by our church to establish these educational programs, and we'll um, talk in a few minutes about um, how to do that. This is a really important resolution that the Episcopal Church um, passed. And I just mentioned um, two things, one of which I'll come back to in a second, but that I was uh, privileged to be at this general convention and to testify in support of this resolution. Um, and I came armed with all of these statements from uh, various Christian bodies from throughout uh, 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 the church about the complementarity of science and faith, and I thought I was going to impress everyone in the room. But what, what was most impressive um, was that there was a group of youth um, there at General Convention, um, high school students, who were part of an official youth presence within the Episcopal Church, and they really spoke from the heart. Um, they talked about how important it would be for them, for their church, to, infer, to affirm the compatibility of science and faith so that they could go back to their high schools and to tell their friends um, that you don't have to choose between uh, a love of God and uh, a love of science. Um, and you could have heard a pin drop um, as some of them spoke about the importance of this resolution to them. The second thing that I would mention is if you keep Barber's fourfold typology in mind here, um, in, in a classic Anglican way, what this resolution is doing is not prescribing in, in every detail how exactly um, science and, and the Christian faith are complementary. Um, it leaves open a variety of different positions uh, uh, within the, the umbrella of complementarity. Um, but it, it does uh, uh, make sure to state that the, that the Episcopal Church denies that there is a fundamental conflict between science, technology, and medicine um, and the Christian faith insofar as it's received and practiced in the Episcopal Church. Um, I think that's a, a hugely important uh, uh, statement to make. Church of England has made a similar statement too, which I can um, send to anyone who's interested. So this is a statement of the Episcopal Church, but what about some of the mechanisms within the Episcopal Church to engage 
this um, uh, uh, set of issues at the, at the nexus of science and religion. Well, the, the formal, the official body within the Episcopal Church um, is one of the uh, CCABs, the uh, Councils, Commissions, Agencies, Boards in the Episcopal Church. Um, uh, individuals who are appointed by the presiding bishop and president of the House of Deputies to sit on various committees um, and carry out the, the church's business between the general conventions. Um, general convention being um, a little Episcopal polity 101 here, uh, being the main mechanism for, um, for the Episcopal Church to de decide on um, issues of importance to the, the church at large. Um, so between general conventions and various resolutions related to science, technology, and faith are, are passed. Um, this body, the uh, ECCSTF for short, um, is tasked with carrying out the work on that resolution. Um, as I said, individuals are, are appointed to this and serve for, uh, for the triennium between conventions. Um, and uh, this uh, triennium, uh, for instance, two resolutions that were passed at the 77th General Convention and will be taken up again at the 78th General Convention um, are, one is a resolution on uh, genetically modified organisms, asking the church to um, do some of its homework on the, the science and theology pertaining to genetically modified or organisms um, to see if, if uh, there is a proper stance for the Episcopal Church to take on this, um, and also the use um, of weaponized drones, um, uh, in, particularly in, in uh, armed conflict. Um, so these are two issues that, that this Executive Council Committee um, is, is working on over the course of, of this triennium. The Executive Council Committee, uh, and I noted just on the um, side of the screen here that we have a, a former member, a former head, I think, of the uh, ECCSTF who can also speak to this, hopefully, uh, at the end of our um, time together. Um, but the ECCF, ECCSTF um, came into existence because of the organizing and advocacy of a group of faithful, dedicated Episcopalians um, who formed themselves from across the Episcopal Church who formed themselves into the Episcopal Network for Science, Technology, and Faith. Um, this was a diffuse uh, network that uh, had dues-paying members. Uh, for a number of years, had a, a newsletter that they would publish, uh, I think, uh, quarterly. Um, they kept pushing the, the church to um, have an official body to address uh, these issues. And as a result, um, the ECC STF came into being. Um, the Episcopal Network for Science, Technology, and Faith um, continues to exist. Uh, it's no longer a dues-paying um, uh, organization. We've said that you are a member of the ENSTF uh, if you like us on Facebook. Um, so if you've done that over the course of this talk, then uh, congratulations, you're a member. Um, but one of the things that we've wanted to do is to try to revitalize local chapters uh, of the Episcopal Network for Science, Technology, and Faith. So that in your parish, uh, in a deanery, a diocese, um, even a, a province, that people who c care about these issues could connect with one another, um, talk about some of the issues uh, at, at the nexus of science and, and religion, uh, and, and take action in, in a local um, context. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that would look like and, and what the ECCA STF could do to support uh, those local chapters if anyone's interested in that. The last thing I'll mention, and then we'll just take a, a quick break here, um, is the Ecumenical Roundtable on Science, Technology, and Faith. Perhaps you saw yesterday, if you're signed up for ENS uh, News Alerts, uh, they had a press release uh, from uh, about the, the latest Ecumenical Roundtable, uh, which the Episcopal Church just hosted at the Episcopal Church Center in Utah, uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, this is a gathering of all uh, major mainline um, uh, Christian denominations, um, primarily Protestant, although there have been Catholic and Orthodox uh, participants in, in the past. Um, but each of these denominational groups uh, comes together once a year to meet separately and to carry out their group's um, particular business, and then convene together uh, as a group and discuss a range of topics uh, from across our den denominational tradition. Um, it's really a rich gathering. Um, it started rather informally maybe a couple of decades ago and has, has grown into a formal annual gathering. Uh, and 
the Episcopal Church is currently working with the Evangelical Lutheran Church um, to make a website and to uh, get some social media up uh, so that we can get the word out about this ecumenical roundtable. Um, but as I mentioned, this year it was hosted by Episcopalians and uh, the president and dean of CDSP, the Church of Divinity School of the Pacific in Berkeley, was the keynote speaker um, and offered a really interesting paper that uh, we live streamed via Google Hangout um, and have archived on YouTube. Uh, I'd be happy to send you that link if you'd be interested. Unfortunately, I forgot to mute my mic, so you see me every time I make a sound, you see uh, my picture pop up. But um, the audio is still good if, you, if the uh, visual is not. But um, let me pause there for a minute and see if there are any questions or comments um, that uh, any of you have before moving on to some real practical nuts and bolts and uh, tapping a few of the members here to talk about what they've done in their local context. Great. Um, and this is Miguel again, uh, and just a, a technical note. Um, since everyone was muted, I think the best way to ask your question to Joseph is using the chat box in the left-hand side of the screen. And then whenever um, we, a little bit later, whenever we move to the broader discussion, we'll try to unmute folks and, and uh, see how it goes. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, please enter them to the uh, left-hand side of the screen, the chat box. Someone said that there's a laughing and clapping feature, so you're welcome to do either one of those. As well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, um, Joan, I see your hand is up. Um, let, let's, since you're on the phone, you I think you can speak. Um, Joan, can you say something? No, I can't. Um, Yes, I was wondering if you have any geologists currently on the um, on the uh, executive council committee, given the, that you were talking quite a bit about um, the con that in quotes conflict between uh, science as in terms of the evolution issues. I'm I'm partly curious because of that if that the the issues have been raised more by, you know, or lifted up by the religious right um, in terms of, especially in terms of issues about evolution. And I was wondering whether or not you've got anybody currently. When I was on the, the committee, there were two of us that were geologists, and I just was curious. I think I caught most of the uh, common uh, question okay. there. Um, if I missed it, then. Sorry. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, yeah, there, there's some really interesting, there's, there's a great piece that we just posted today on the Episcopal Network uh, Facebook page about um, uh, really early responses to Darwinian revolu evolution. Um, uh, a revolution, too. Um, uh, what's really interesting is that many of the um, early Anglican uh, respondents to evolution, um, in including uh, Anglican uh, Charles Kingsley, uh, saw no no threat in evolution uh, to uh, the traditional understanding of, of the Christian God. Um, uh, it was indeed people who tended um, then and, and perhaps now to um, have a more uh, literalistic view of uh, scripture. Um, uh, there are some really interesting um, uh, aspects of this in, historically. Um, uh, my uh, advisor has written a, a book um, on the relationship between early Protestant um, understanding of the scripture as a literal and also a literal reading of, of nature and the orderliness of nature um, that actually helped contribute to the, the rise of science. Uh, uh, which is part of the complexity that uh, I was talking about uh, earlier. Um, and I can send you a link from that book if you're interested. But um, uh, it certainly is the case that uh, today um, it's uh, 
uh, folks like Ken Ham, um, uh, who have read, have a particular reading of Genesis um, that see a conflict when uh, I would assume uh, most of Episcopalians don't see as much of, of a conflict. So thanks for that comment and question. Um, Joseph, there are several other really wonderful questions in the in the chat box. Um, Yeah, I'll start at the bottom here. Um, how can we design a course for all parishes, Faith and Science 101, with some of the resources that you've shared with us here in the past few moments? I'm an active member of our Episcopal Church here in Raleigh, and I've never heard of these resources. Um, uh, this is from Jane. Um, you're setting me up for the next part of my talk, um, so thank you very much for that, Jane. Hopefully, I'll have some, um, some really helpful resources that, that you can um, implement in your parish. But uh, I also want to make sure Jane is from um, Church of the Nativity in Raleigh, who really set up a, an exemplary uh, science and religion um, uh, conversation in their parish. So I'm ho hoping that she will uh, talk about that as well. Um, I've spoken, this is from uh, Rebecca. Uh, you've spoken a great deal about science, mentioning technology in terms of our drones. In what other context will um, uh, technology be addressed? Um, yeah, you, you um, pointed out the flaw of this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and that I'm not really talking about technology or medicine in great detail, partly because um, those two books um, and the responses to them, this Draper White conflict myth, um, the, the focus certainly within the academy has been on the history of, of science in particular. Um, not so much on the history of technology, although there are some really interesting treatments, um, and more and more increasingly here of late about the history of, of religion and, and technology. Um, I'd be happy to point to some of those resources. Um, I do have one blog that I, I would uh, flag up. It's, it's listed in the resources here, so we'll come back to it, but in answer to your question, I'll mention it now. Um, it's called Techrement, um, like sacrament, but uh, with the tech, um, and and that blog does a really good job. It's it's very recent and does a really good job of trying to think through a lot of emergent technologies um, through a, a richly theological lens. Um, and everything that I've seen them do so far uh, has has been really good. Um, so that's one resource that I would um, would point you to. Um, but uh, if you have any other questions, then we can certainly talk more about that offline. Um, uh, here, a question from Matt Olson regarding integration. What knowledge can religion contribute uh, to science? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I go back to the various isms uh, that I, I mentioned that philosophers of science have, have tended to devote a lot of time to. Uh, uh, materialism, naturalism, um, um, uh, reductionism. Um, and in, indeed, uh, a lot of folks are talking about of late scientism. Um, I think the real question is uh, whether and to what extent science gives us a whole, complete, and accurate picture of the world. Um, we, one of the things we've learned from the history of science uh, from Thomas Kuhn and the structure of the scientific revolution is that there have been a number of, of revolutions in, uh, within science, um, and science as a discipline is always um, open-ended. Um, so many uh, certain things that we take for granted within our scientific theories of, of the day um, uh, could, could certainly be open-ended. Um, other theories, uh, as we've uh, seen here of late with um, the, the Big Bang becoming ever more complicated, um, could be confirmed. Um, uh, but but science, I think, in, in general, if you're uh, asking for my, my personal opinion, um, gives a very accurate description of the natural world. Um, the question is whether that description is complete. Um, for instance, in a scientific um, description of what it means to be human, um, is science uh, in and of itself uh, adequate to give a full and complete picture of what it means to be human? Um, and for me, that's where uh, faith, theology, can come in to supplement um, uh, some of the worldview that, that science gives us. But go back to that resolution, too, and say uh, that, that 
science itself plays a really important role in our theological uh, formulation, uh, and, and in my opinion, at least, that, uh, that some form of, of dialogue between the two would be most fruitful. Um, for instance, uh, the, the latest projections on, on climate change have really pushed theologians to reconsider uh, our, our place within the world and our response to um, climate change. Uh, so, uh, so that's one of the many, many areas that, uh, that um, science can make a massive contribution to our understanding of the world uh, and our place within it. Um, great question. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> So is, if it's OK, I think I'll, I'll move on to this more practical piece. And then I want to make sure, um, run through this maybe quickly, because I want to make sure that we have time for folks to uh, respond um, and uh, share from uh, your ideas and best practices. Um, series. Uh, uh, whether you're you're close to a university or not, and have access to academics who spend all day long thinking about these issues, um, undoubtedly, no matter where you are, there are community leaders, um, likely scientists within your pews, um, and ecumenical and interfaith partners uh, who uh, you could tap to put together a really interesting speaker series um, within your parish. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about if if you do that. Um, please communicate to your local media that you're going to do that because uh, uh, local media tends to be really interested in those kinds of speaker, uh, speaker series. Um, the second idea would be to form discussion groups or um, uh, study circles within your parish, uh, whether that's an adult forum or a teen forum. Um, uh, one resource, and there are, there are tons of resources, I've, a number of them listed uh, on the back of this presentation, but one of those that was put together by the previous iteration of the Executive Council Committee on Science, Technology, and Faith uh, is the Catechism of Creation uh, that goes through and addresses, uh, in particular, um, doctrine of uh, creation uh, in light of contemporary evolutionary theory. Um, and does a really good job of, of addressing uh, a whole variety of, of issues that that, uh, that come up. That, uh, Catechism is being reworked right now. Um, it's available uh, on the Episcopal Science website. Uh, they're working to try to get it into a printed form. Um, so keep your eye out for that. But at the moment, you can uh, download it all from the EpiscopalScience.org uh, website. Follow the links to Catechism of Creation. Um, there are a number, any number, of uh, essays and books on the relationship between science and religion that I would recommend. Uh, one of those that you have right here in your files, the first, or it looks like the first file, um, the Grafton Venner uh, essay um, from the Episcopal Church of Scotland um, called Sketches Towards a, a Theology of Science. Um, this is a, a free resource uh, from the Episcopal Church of Scotland, a theological commission that they set up to study science and theology. Um, does a really good job of, of giving an overview of some of the main issues and discussing them from an Anglican perspective. Um, it's free. You have the link to the PDF there. And they also have a wonderful bibliography at the um, end of, of that essay uh, that suggests some, some really good further reading. Another thing I would flag up is the International Society for the Study of Science and Religion. Uh, at a recent huge project where they uh, asked some of the leading scholars in the field to identify the 250 most important books in the academic discipline of science and religion. Uh, and they, uh, they purchased all those books in one big lot and, um, and gave them to libraries throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, you can go on the website to see if the library near you has all 250 books um, in their collection. But the other thing is that they asked these scholars to give a one or two page uh, introduction overview of all of these books. Um, and that, that book, the companion to the ISSR library, is available online for free. You can download it, read it on Google Books, read it on a tablet, read it on Scribe. Um, and, and you can get a sense for what the leading academics in the field of science and religion today um, have to say about uh, some of these most foundational uh, text. There are also tons of multimedia resources that are especially helpful if you're trying to lead 
the a conversation within a, a parish context. One that I would flag up to you is the test of faith um, that interviews a number of leading uh, theologians and philosophers, historians from across the world on a variety of, of different issues at the Nexus of Science and Religion. Uh, and what's especially great about the Test of Faith series, many of the videos you can find um, on their website and on YouTube for free. Um, but they have some real digestible two to five minute snippets on particular issues uh, that can you can really tease out um, or drill down into uh, a particular issue and, uh, and start a group conversation with, with that resource. Um, there's also a great uh, multimedia curriculum called Painting the Stars, Science, Religion, and Evolving Faith uh, that, that's available uh, for purchase. It's a bit pricey. Um, I've tried to limit some of these resources here to the, the free and cheap end, um, especially for those smaller parishes out there. Um, but, but it's a really good curriculum that, that addresses a whole range of subjects. Uh, also, the Faraday Institute at Cambridge and the Ian Ramsey Center at Oxford and a number of, of different academic centers have um, a huge archive of free uh, downloadable podcasts, um, both video and audio podcasts, of lectures from leading scholars from across the world um, lecturing on a whole range of subjects. Um, and, and both of those websites are fully searchable, so you can type in uh, an issue of particular interest to you. And um, I would highly recommend those. Again, links to all this stuff is at the end of the presentation, so you don't have to write this all down furiously. Um, if you missed it, um, Bishop Nick Nisley, uh, Bishop uh, from Rhode Island, wrote a book for Forward Movement that sold out, uh, I was told, three times uh, this month, um, called Lent is Not Rocket Science. Um, it's a great little uh, resource. Uh, for use of personal reflection and parish study, uh, I'd highly commit it to you for next Lent. Um, and harkening back to what I mentioned about the youth presence at General Convention testifying to their resolution, uh, it's just the importance of thinking about incorporating issues of science and faith uh, into uh, confirmation classes and catechesis classes um, for youth. Um, youth in high school tend to be really wrestling with these issues. Uh, it's just a perfect time to put some of these resources into their hands um, and to hear from them, uh, their perspectives on, on how they reconcile their commitment to um, science um, uh, and their commitment to uh, faith. Uh, I'd also recommend engaging campus ministry. I've had the privilege of serving in a variety of uh, campus ministry contexts. Um, and likewise, uh, students at the university level are still really wrestling with these issues, especially those who come from um, context where, where some of the fundamental questions um, were, were not necessarily raised or dealt with. So um, uh, if you're involved in campus ministry or you're um, close to a campus, uh, think about doing some outreach um, uh, within that local Episcopal campus ministry to engage dialogue on some of these issues. Um, finally, the, establishing a parish library um, can be a wonderful resource to people in your churches. Um, Maybe looking back to that uh, ISSR library and companion to see some uh, uh, really good books that you could purchase for your parish library. Uh, you'd be amazed at what people would um, uh, take from your shelves. Um, so uh, that's something to think about. I mentioned just a few liturgical ideas and resources here. Um, first of all, a sermon series. Uh, both clergy and uh, lay preachers uh, could, could address subjects of science and religion from the pulpit. Um, our presenting bishop, Captain Jeffrey Shorey, has done this a number of times. Um, and we have uh, Father Scott on the call, um, who, if you see this picture here at the bottom of your screen, um, I got a Google alert article from the Telegraph in Macon, Georgia, um, that, that flagged up this sermon series uh, on science and faith that uh, a parish priest uh, there uh, uh, did and so that's that's a wonderful way of engaging these subjects from the um, uh, from the pulpit. And I hope Father Scott will uh, and some of his parishioners, so some of his parishioners on the call, will talk about that. Um, if you uh, knew it, uh, we have colleagues from the BCP that that address the relationship of science and faith in a beautiful way. Uh, I've listed here colleagues number forty in the back of the BCP. Um, under prayers for the natural order, for the knowledge of God's creation. There are a number of um, collects and prayers uh, listed there in the back of the BCP 
um, that are, would be really helpful for use in the liturgical context. Um, there are also great hymns within our church. Um, the one I've listed here is the Praise, of, Praise the Source of Faith and Learning by um, an Episcopal um, scholar, Tom Schroeder, at uh, Yale uh, and Berkeley Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, but if you're ever uh, uh, bored in church, not that that happens to any of us, um, but open up your uh, 1982 hymnal and look in the back um, under uh, the subject of creation, and, and you'll be amazed at uh, the, some of the hymns that we have within our, our hymnal um, that are, are not always used within our liturgical context. It's a great resource right there um, uh, begging to be used. And there are various uh, potential tie-ins throughout the course of the lit liturgical year. Um, there are various frees of Tehar de Chardin on uh, April 10th, uh, Copernicus and Kepler on May 23rd, St. Francis of Assisi, October 1st, and the Feast of C.S. Lewis on uh, November 22nd. Any one of these feast days uh, within our church's calendar um, could be used to flag up issues related to um, science and faith from the, the massive contributions that these individuals um, have made within the history of science. Um, and perhaps you've seen uh, over the past couple of years, there's been increasing calls for a Lenten carbon fast. Um, uh, most of us give up chocolate or coffee or something like that for Lent, but, um, but what about taking a fast from uh, carbon and trying to minimize our carbon footprint? Um, there are tons of resources available out there uh, for this, something to consider and to um, implement within your congregation. I talked earlier about um, the Episcopal Network, the local chapters um, that we're attempting to establish within parishes, deaneries, dioceses. Um, again, the idea of a speaker series or study circles, um, ecumenical and interfaith discussions, and especially media outreach. Um, that one of the ways that this supposed conflict is, is perpetuated is uh, through popular media. So I think it's especially important uh, for individuals to reach out uh, through local media and social media um, to, to have other voices heard. Um, local chapters could also contribute to convention, both proposing resolutions and testifying to resolutions um, uh, on matters pertaining to science and faith. That could go all the way from diocese up to general convention uh, for consideration. One resolution here uh, was passed in the Diocese of Central Gulf Coast, um, endorsing the Clergy Letter Project, um, Evolution Weekend, uh, that uh, is, is dedicated to talking about the compatibility of Christian faith and evolution. Um, I realize I'm running short on time, so I'm trying to run through these quickly. Um, again, talked about the importance of communication. Um, I have an article here that was recently published in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch by an Episcopal priest, Reverend Pamela um, Dolan, that talked about faith and science can work together for change. It was a wonderful op-ed uh, that was published in a local newspaper. Uh, reaching out through traditional media outlets uh, to engage these issues is, is incredibly important. If you're going to do a sermon series or speaker series within your parish, um, it's worth contacting some of your, your local newspaper contacts uh, and television um, stations and let them know that you're going to do this. Um, uh, they, they can be very interested in that kind of thing. Um, and it's just the importance of social media. We live in a, a culture where uh, media can go viral rather quickly. Uh, so engaging through Facebook and Twitter and other social media on, on these issues is incredibly important. Whether that's your personal, um, uh, establishing a personal blog or using your personal social media, or your parish or diocesan newsletters and magazines are also great ways um, to address a variety of issues at the Nexus of Science and Faith. There's a picture here in your top right corner of the screen of a church um, that had faith and science listed on their website and the uh, stands of, of their church alongside other um, topics of, of what they believe as a church. Uh, so that kind of thing can be especially helpful for, for newcomers to your church. Um, in addition to op-eds and letters to the editor and your local um, newspapers uh, and local media coverage of parish and events, uh, I'd, I'd recommend that everyone on the call think about signing up for the NPR's uh, Public Insight Network is the uh, place where you can go and uh, put your name and your contact information and your areas of expertise um, wherever you are. Uh, NPR uh, uh, tends to um, tap on individuals within this Public Insight Network to comment on a variety of stories within a local context. Um, so uh, it would be really good for um, some faithful Episcopalians to sign up for that. 
I listed all these resources for the sake of time. Um, I wanted to have more time for people to in engage here. Um, uh, uh, but uh, I'll let you just read through those. If you have any questions about any of these, um, I'll leave my contact information um, at the end. Please feel free to contact me. If you have particular questions about things that uh, I haven't covered here, I'd be more than happy to suggest um, some resources that uh, are available to you. Um, I'd, I'd especially recommend these selected articles and podcasts as a great way to get a, a good overview and an introduction to some of these issues. All of these are relatively short and could be used within uh, an adult forum. Um, but uh, in the time that remains, and maybe we could stay a little longer if it's OK, <laughs> uh, to have some conversation about this. Um, I'm particularly Certainly. interested in hearing from uh, from Father Scott, who has started a um, sermon series from, from Jane to Church of Nativity in Raleigh, uh, who started a science and religion dialogue in her um, context, and from uh, Luke, who's about to go to seminary um, and uh, uh, with a science background to address these issues in the parish, and, and the rest of you. Great, and uh, Scott, I think you're unmuted now so if you uh, okay. okay great go ahead so is the sound coming through okay yep well uh, uh, Brandon and Miguel good to see you at ECF and, and Joseph uh, thank you for your presentation of learning it's great um, just want to share briefly we at All Saints in Warner Robins Georgia um, really looking for an opportunity to take advantage of uh, this cosmos uh, cosmos uh, Series that was going on on Fox and, and also on the Discovery Channel, and thought, but well, wouldn't that be an interesting way to engage uh, the world? I mean, Carl Barth uh, talked about, you know, preach with the gospel in one hand and, and the newspaper in the other, and in our day and age, it's uh, really the television or the media. And so um, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to, to, to use science uh, as a way to talk about um, our faith? Uh, we ended up doing just three. Um, but we tied it into the, the Cosmos series, but also used science as a way to explore um, sort of the, the different, uh, you know, the landscape of science and faith. And um, I, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had, uh, we, we made sure that we talked to local media. We're in a, a small to a mid-market um, media-wise, and, you know, they're always looking for news stories and was able to get some, uh, able to get some coverage, which was great. Um, we had a writer come out and sit through the first sermon, and I didn't put him to sleep, which was good. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and he wrote this really, you know, I, I didn't know what he was going to write, so I, I, I was a little bit nervous about that, but I uh, ended up really writing a, a great article, um, and it's linked now in, in, uh, on this series. So I, I, I did three. I did uh, The first sermon was on um, sort of the landscape of science and faith, from young earthers to intelligent design to... Um, sort of trying to hold the science and faith in tension to the other extreme, uh, sort of the Dawkins sort of rant against faith, um, and didn't try to pigeonhole anybody, but tried to show that you can't hold science and faith together. The second sermon uh, I did was on uh, on black holes and God, the idea that uh, you only know black holes and God by your experience of it. You can't actually see them. Uh, and then the third one, uh, use science, you know, the multiverse and Jesus as stumbling blocks. Uh, how do we how do we wrestle with big ideas and and how do we uh, how do we engage it? So it really became sort of a platform of really kind of, in a sense, evangelizing the congregation, uh, but through the medium of science. So uh, really happy to to share more if that's helpful. But uh, it's a great experience um, and pretty much well received by uh, by the parish. Uh, we got one interesting article written for the Telegraph. A, a young earther kind of, you know, chimed in and said, "No, the the Earth is only about 10,000 years old," and um, and that was fine because we didn't try to say it was wrong. I, I basically said, you know, some of these positions are hard to hold. Uh, can we look at, at the, the exploration of science and faith and and hold them together? And I think we can. Um, so, I, but this has been great for me. I, I there are a lot of resources I had no idea. I guess I was kind of a rogue priest in Georgia talking about science and faith and. And to discover there's so many great resources, so this has been great. Great, and um, Joseph, uh, we'll let's let's stay on for a, a few more minutes because there's such a, a good amount of discussion, at least till eight ten or eight fifteen. Um, but just in case people need to leave, um, can you please put your uh, con email in into the chat box so that people can be in yeah. touch with you? Um, I have all my uh, contact information listed on that PowerPoint. Um, so 
but I'll, I'll list that here in chat. Great. And for those of you who have to head out, uh, thank you for attending. Um, uh, we will uh, we will be sending a recording as well as the resources mentioned um, a little bit later. Um, I noticed that uh, Malene has her um, hand raised. If people want to um, ask a question, the chat box is the easiest way because uh, well, anyway. <laughs> or you can call in using the number that's just under David Emery uh, uh's picture. Um, the number is one eight five five seven four two three zero seven four, and that's uh, that's the way to best way to have your voice uh, part of the pre uh, presentation. <clears throat> Um, I noticed a few questions also during uh, while, while we were presenting, so as folks type in. Um, one of the questions was, are there any resources that you would recommend, Joseph, for uh, kindergarten through sixth grade, which is a, uh, uh, an area that I don't think I heard uh, you cover? Darn. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had something off the top of my head. Uh, my uh, my wife was a Christian formation director for a number of years, so I, I should have come armed with that. Um, on the resources, the, the ELCA has developed some resources uh, for youth with youth. Um, it's, I think a three-part series, uh, as well as some resources for campus ministry. Um, youth I'm just defining as a high school age. Um, but uh, that's a great question. and. If you will send me an email, um, I'll do some digging and ask around and see if I can't get something to you. But uh, uh, but nothing immediately comes to mind. Sorry. And Luke, um, I see that your hand is raised. Uh, if you want to call in on the number one eight five five seven four two, that's that'll be the best way to have the conversation. Um, let's see. A, a question from Sherry Folk, are there guidelines um, from Executive Council or perhaps from the network um, uh, on the establishment of a chapter? Um, that's a, another good question. We have not developed any guidelines per se. Um, there have, there's one chapter in the D.C. area that was recently established um, and we're trying to use them as a, a pilot project, um, if you will. On, on how to go about doing this. Um, uh, one of my colleagues on the Executive Council Committee um, is taking the lead on that uh, in particular, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with them if you'd like to uh, email me. Um, I think the, the main question we would have would be, uh, how can we be a support? Um, what would you need in order to be uh, successful? Um, uh, Resources are things that we can provide, uh, encouragement, um, mechanisms for engagement, ideas, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and if guidelines would uh, be something that would be helpful, we can work on um, that as well. Great. Uh, and Luke, uh, you are on. Hi there, Luke. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Um, as Joseph mentioned earlier, and I want to thank him for bringing this to the attention of us. This has been a great talk, um, especially with the resources in a local parish. My experience has been a little bit different. Um, mine has been lately with a Bachelor's of Science in Biology at University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, it's a very diverse campus, uh, both in um, demographics, education level, and religion. Um, and so, and I'm as Joseph also mentioned, off to seminary at Yale this fall for the Episcopal uh, Holy Orders. So it, it's been a it's been an interesting juxtaposition of both science and religion, um, and I've been afforded a lot of opportunity to discuss my faith within the context of my understanding of molecular and cellular biology, mainly. And I think some of the some of the best ways of communicating and some of the biggest 
uh, hurdles that they face are kind of the the um, stronghold that uh, perhaps impression that that science and religion have always been in this conflict, and not only have they been, but they will continue to be um, in conflict. And so, a lot of people are just kind of thrown back by by starting a dialogue in regards uh, to religion and science. And so, especially on the campus ministry side, uh, I was of course one of the older students. I spent 16 years in engineering, um, but the, the way to open up that dialogue is, of course, to be uh, able to discuss our faith out in the open. Um, and sometimes that's hard for, for um, some Episcopalians. I, I'll just put that on the table. I was fortunately raised Baptist, so that was really easy for me to talk about um, and to kind of offer up. So my evangelical background uh, really opened that up. But I found a lot of compatriots within within the science scientific field, uh, neuroendocrinologists, neurobiologists, um, some of the ecologists that I've talked to and really opened up a cool dialogue within the college itself um, and set up groups within kind of an interface, uh, you know, between Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity, and also kind of a science uh, spin on that and how we interpret it. So I would encourage anybody that's that's looking to, to, to do this in the future is, is really the the biggest thing for the campus ministry is just to start the dialogue and uh, and let them know you're out there and let them know your presence and, and um, you know, without kind of this, this strong uh, position to kind of just feather your way into these conversations. Um, and, and hopefully within uh, the institution of Yale, then uh, we'll continue with the medical, um, the calling for the medical field and for the priesthood. So. Um, that's, that's, I guess, my encouragement uh, and my experience over the last few years has just been to open up that dialogue, start a communication line, um, and, and even if you just drop it as a, uh, as a quick note, um, it oftentimes blossoms and, uh, and turns into a wonderful conversation down the road. Great. Thanks, Luke. I'm not sure if everyone can read the chat box, but there's also been a, a really helpful comment here from Yolanda Lee that uh, looking at the Episcopal Peace Fellowship and, and other groups like that, um, have some great models for local chapters, um, back to the earlier question. Um, so with that, we want to share some, uh, again, contact information, uh, also just let folks know that um, oh, it looks like there's some next steps. <laughs> Joseph, would you like to finish? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I forgot about this part, um, but, but just re real quickly, and this is um, picking up on uh, what I think Luke was, was just saying, um, but uh, the, uh, my charge to you would be fourfold. Um, would, as you go out from here, would uh, be to marvel. Um, I think at the, the heart of, of faith is, is awe, um, and our, our wondering at the beauty and majesty of creation uh, is itself a form of, of worship. Um, how wondrous are your works, O Lord, as it says in uh, Psalm 92. Um, so, uh, so go out into the world and, and, and marvel um, at the, uh, the picture that, that the, the very best that science and technology gives us of, of our world. Um, the second charge would be to, to do, um, to, to state your case by making, as Albert Schweitzer said, uh, your life, your argument. Um, uh, it's, it's incredibly important for uh, us as Episcopalians, as people of faith, um, especially those of us who are in the science fields, um, to be scientists and to be engineers, um, to be technologists, and to work in the cutting edge of uh, healthcare professions. Um, uh, and to make your, your life your, your argument about the, the engagement of, of science and faith. Uh, it says in uh, Castle of Matthew that you shall love me with all your heart, soul, and mind. Um, uh, Episcopalian didn't invent that uh, not leaving your mind at the door thing. It's, it's right there in the Gospels. Um, uh, third, uh, third charge to you would be to, to go. Um, that going is at the heart of the, the Great Commission. Um, uh, what I was so inspired about the early iteration of the Episcopal Network for Science, Technology, and Faith is that, uh, that they didn't wait for permission. These were individuals that just organized themselves and said this is an issue, a set of issues that needs to be engaged. Uh, 
Uh, and because of that, uh, formal uh, institutions within our, our church um, uh, came to, into being. But, but at the heart of that were these committed individuals who saw a need to engage these issues and went out and, and did it. Um, so I'd encourage you, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, um, to, uh, to engage these issues uh, where you are. Um, and finally, uh, my, my fourth charge would be to share um, that uh, Episcopalians tend to um, break out in hives when the word uh, witness is, is mentioned. Um, uh, it's been co-opted um, uh, by, by others. But uh, I think at the heart of witness is just sharing your story, um, sharing your perspective, um, uh, your experience with the matters of, uh, related to science, technology, medicine, faith uh, is incredibly important. Uh, um, for you to communicate and to contribute to the larger conversation in the various ways that we've talked about so far, to talk with others, um, and uh, I've listened to the, the countering the clamorous, that it tends to be those the, the most clamorous voices, uh, the most contentious voices among us that, that tend to get uh, a lot of the attention and play. Um, so it's especially important for people who have a more um, uh, even-handed approach to these matters to make sure to, that they are contributing to the conversation um, as well, um, as it says in Mark 16, to go into the world and share the good news. Um, and there's all my contact information. Please get in touch if you have any questions or suggestions for resources that I could uh, we could add to this list and post on uh, Vine. Um, that would be tremendously helpful. Um, and really appreciate your time, uh, attention, and, and uh, contribution to this. Thanks a lot. And the w one final note is that um, uh, in your email inbox, there should be a, a survey for this uh, webinar. So um, ECF, we're always trying to improve our webinars. And we'll also, uh, and I know, Joseph, it, I think this might be his first webinar as well, so uh, it's an opportunity to uh, learn. Um, so please send your feedback, and um, we thank you again for, for attending. So have a good evening, everyone.